Dobro utro. Oh, that was terrible. Terrible. Dobro utro. Oh, that's better. Okay, good. Uh, wow, that's hot. Can we turn that down just a little? I get excited when I talk, and I don't want to pin you against the back wall. So that. Uh, <laughs> Thank you so much to, to Dimitri. We have been friends for a long time. We've talked. We've met several places around the world, and I've never made it here until this year. And I'm, I was so excited when it worked out that I could come. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you for inviting me, organizers, and thank you for, uh, for coming. So uh, let's get started. This morning's session is kind of an, an introduction because so many times people look at security as this big ball of difficult topics and it's hard to really know where to start. Uh, and, and that's because security in general is kind of a complex topic, but it doesn't always have to be, right? So let's, let's back up and let's start in gently, and uh, I think you'll see it's, it's actually not so imposing. Uh, so welcome to this morning's session on spring security for noobs. And that's not derogatory at all. We're all noobs in far more topics than we are expert, right? So, so it's okay. Um, we're, we're just kind of going to get started and, like I said, dive in. Um, my name is Mark Heckler, and um, the best way to reach me, well, actually, the best way to reach me is Twitter. Uh, who here follows me on Twitter? And the rest of you, why? Why not? <laughs> Seriously, though, that's probably the best way to reach your favorite open source committers of any kind, any stripe, any place. Uh, I live on Twitter. So if you uh, have any questions, comments, or feedback, uh, catch me in the hallway, sure. But if you think of something later, by all means, ping me on Twitter. Uh, I kind of, I even sleep tweet, so <laughs> I'm on round the clock. Uh, if you have any questions or comments or feedback and you don't want to share them with the whole world, uh, my DMs, my direct messages are open, so you can DM me anytime as well. Um, and if you aren't on Twitter, hate Twitter, don't like it, have questions or feedback that fit in more, that, that require more than 280 characters, I am a member of the slightly older and more established social network called email. Uh, anyone on email? So, so you can reach me by email. I'm just not quite as fast on the responses because I don't live on email. Uh, but I do check it from, from time to time. So, um, and I'm already getting dry, so I'm going to be hitting this, I can tell. So who am I? I have authored several blogs and blog posts. I've co-authored a couple of books. Uh, and I've contributed content and code to several other books, some of which even recognized my contributions. That was nice. Um, the others, well, I wasn't intending to make a living off the royalties anyway, so who cares, right? Uh, I am an architect and developer, uh, and as you might guess from the next point where most of my expertise has been built, it's in the Java ecosystem. Uh, I'm not just, I don't just code in Java though. Uh, any Kotlin fans here? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Kotlin's a, a nice language as well. Uh, Groovy, anybody? Wow, I really expected more than that. Anyway. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, so the JVM's a thriving, rich ecosystem. And, um, you know, I spent a lot of time there, as you probably have as well. I am a Java champion, a Java 1 rock star, a Groundbreaker ambassador, a few other, um, you know, nice things that will get you a really nice latte if you throw in a few love with it. Uh, I am also a professional problem solver. Uh, that's not my official title, it's just what I do, as do you, right? That's why we're all here. Uh, but my official, officially, I am a Spring developer and advocate, and I also am the creator and sole curator of uh, Spring Noticias en Español. So if there are any hispanohablantes among us, uh, any Spanish speakers, uh, send me your articles, videos, what whatever. All right, all right. And uh, I'll happily include those. I, I put out a periodic newsletter uh, with that, so... Okay, so very quickly, uh, some takeaways for today. Uh, I'd like to start with just a kind of a concept, contextual, uh, building a contextual understanding of outside-in security. Uh, and, and again, I'm going to go through that fairly quickly, but just to kind of establish some context there. Uh, system versus application security and what we're kind of talking about uh, where and, and when and how does that all fit. Uh, authentication and authorization, uh, or as I like to call it, who's who in the zoo, who's doing what to whom when and how, uh, and explain kind of the, the basic concepts you hear thrown around a lot, security, sometimes a little interchangeably, <laughs> not always correctly. Uh, Open ID Connect and OAuth 2, uh, what do they do, what their value is, uh, and then actually pretty much all of this, I kind of 
touch on it, and then we dive into code. Because I've always felt like, at least for me, I understand things far better when I see them in action, right? So that's kind of my approach. So, outside insecurity, and I always caveat this with sort of, uh, this is actually still being, this, this diagram and this concept is still actually being promoted by the CISSP, uh, a bit to my consternation. <laughs> but um, this was kind of the model for system security, application security a long time ago. And I guess conceptually, it's not terrible if you don't necessarily put it in that neat format, the nested format. But this is kind of the way it used to work, right? You had your policies, procedures, and awareness, and that kind of enveloped uh, your physical security. And of course, your, 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 um, your data centers and your, uh, your campus, your, uh, your co corporate campuses, uh, obviously surrounded your network stack. This is how the ingress and egress was managed to your systems, uh, which kind of worked alongside and with your server stack, your physical servers and physical racks and physical buildings. Uh, and then you have application stacks. Of course, you host your applications on those physical machines, right? Uh, and then, of course, your application would wrap your databases, your data stores. And again, that feels a little dated, right? Uh, because cloud deployments have shuffled or inverted some of these, and they've kind of eliminated others, right? Uh, because you may have your data, database hosted and provided by a provider on an separ entirely separate cloud or clouds from your applications. Uh, you have policies, procedures, and what have you, but of course, they don't, I guess they kind of virtually surround everything, uh, but it's certainly not that nested structure that we once saw in the, in the quote, good old days. But again, the principles apply if you refocus them for this century. Again, it's 2019, so we have to adapt things a little bit. Because what typically happens is we deploy applications and containers that a lot of times are based on images that are provided by someone else. And we're responsible for securing these while we deploy them to yet another cloud. So it's not quite as neat as perhaps it once was. Uh, just kind of high-level thoughts on, on system security. Obviously, you should have good password or access hygiene. Uh, Two-factor authentication or multi-factor authentication gives you a great deal more security than just a user ID and password. Uh, you should have sane authorizations. Uh, there, there's a principle called the principle of least privilege, and I think that's been hammered to the point that it kind of constricts us, right? And you don't want your access uh, privileges to be so constricted that you have a five-minute change that takes five weeks to deploy either policy-wise or just uh, permissions-wise, right? So sane authorizations make sense, where we can still move out rapidly and compete in the modern world. Uh, we should also have good logging and auditing, because that allows us, when things go wrong, when there's a compromise or when there's a, an attack, that we can see that happening in real time or near real time and respond quickly as well. You should have wire encryption, so things like TLS. You should secure your communication via HTTPS. Uh, in the old days, of course, that was viewed as a huge performance penalty. Uh, Google actually converted everything to secure communication, and they found that it was a 1% performance penalty with a 2% network penalty. It's almost nothing. Now, there are other reasons to do that, one of which is kind of cosmetic, right? Because if you use a Chrome browser, and I think pretty much any browser now, uh, it will warn you if you hit an unsecured and a and it's plain old HTTP site. So if you're deploying single-page apps, um, where your users pull this up and it says, hey, this is an insecure application. That's not necessarily good, uh, good optics either. But of course, it's just good. It makes good sense to encrypt everything over the wire. And then, of course, you should also store your, secure, your secrets securely. Uh, passing around everything in plain text, storing it in plain text is not a good look as well. Uh, it's not secure. And with that in mind also, anytime you have data at rest, because we've talked about over the wire, but anytime you have data at rest, it should be encrypted as well. Because if you secure your outer boundary and somehow someone gets through, uh, many times, of course, we have workplace uh, compromises, uh, employee compromises. If someone can get at your data and it's not encrypted, they have the keys to your kingdom. So of course, you should lock that down as well. We could talk about any one of these things all day. Uh, we don't have all day, so I just wanted to kind of touch on those briefly before we dive in a little bit deeper into application security. <clears throat> Specifically, Spring Security. Uh, everything I show you today, everything I talk about is 100% open source. 
So Spring Security is hosted out on GitHub. You can take a look at it yourself. Uh, you can download the, uh, the, the dependencies, the, the libraries. You can download the bits if you want to. You can contribute if you'd like. And that's encouraged, by the way. Uh, we're very community driven. But um, Spring Security, uh, it's widely used, uh, of course, with any Java applications, but particularly Spring, Spring Boot. And again, security can be rather complex. We're going to back up at a higher level and kind of look at it and drive in from there and uh, kind of explore things. So at a high level, there are three. I was going to say I don't see that very well from the side, but uh, yeah, I, it is showing up. So there are three kind of key concepts that I like to point to in Spring Security. One is the HTTP firewall, because many times when you have a, an application that's compromised, or generally a network that's compromised, a lot of it starts with a bad request, a garbage URI. So if you have bad characters in your, your request, a lot of times it gets through and causes un, unexpected damage. The HTTP, HTTP firewall is something new with Spring Security 5. And I say new, but that's been around for maybe a little over a year now. Uh, and the HTTP firewall filters out invalid URIs. So right off the bat, you're closing a lot of those attack vectors that would just be out there, right? Um, the security filter chain, and I'll get into this a bit more in the next slide, but the security filter chain is what I consider the secret sauce, uh, because that's where you determine or you, you specify what is allowed. If something does get through the HTTP firewall, uh, because it's a valid URI, what happens next is it's compared against several filters that you can establish. If it doesn't meet any of those filters, if it doesn't match any of those, the, the request is simply not processed. So once again, that shuts another one of those attack vectors. And then finally, we have request headers. The Internet Engineering Task Force uh, defines certain request headers uh, that you can define, or that you can specify, I should say, um, which will close a lot of those holes again. Uh, things like uh, cross-site scripting and clickjacking and um, uh, other things that we'll get into as we go as well. But this allows you to lock down, again, more and more of those potential vulnerabilities that you might expose inadvertently in your applications. So, oh, and of course, yes, again, there is more, uh, but again, we've got a limited time, and I wanted to focus kind of on the key points. So this also is a bit simplified, but it kind of covers the points well. Uh, the request filtering. So typically in a Spring application, a Spring security secured application, you'll have a filter chain proxy uh, which is, can be, can comprise multiple security filter chains. Typically what you have is just one, right? But you can have the capability of having multiple security filter chains. But typically what happens is you'll, again, with a single chain, specify various filters. And you go from most specific to least specific, and it goes down, and each request kind of goes through the list. And it says, do I match this one? I don't. Go and check the next one. I don't match that either. Go on, check the next one. And if it doesn't match any, again, the request is simply killed. So um, yeah, that's pretty much everything I wanted and needed to cover there. So let's code. <laughs> this is the application security tire fire. Uh, <laughs> hopefully, we won't run into that today. So let's, uh, let's go out there. And here we go. Oh, I'm not mirrored. What the heck? Let's see. We can fix this. Oh, look at that. That's better. OK, so maximize. That's nice. And OK, so that looks good. OK, does anyone recognize this site? Oh, come on. Really? Oh. <laughs> Yeah, OK, somebody hasn't had enough coffee this morning, I can tell. And that's me. No, I'm kidding. Uh, so we'll, we'll meet after, after the session for coffee, right? This is the new Spring Initializer, fairly new. It's uh, been around a couple of months now. If you haven't visited this site lately, this probably looks a bit different to you. Uh, everything is still there, pretty much. Uh, we've streamlined things. We've made it a lot neater and, and faster in, faster out. Uh, if there's something that you liked from before that you don't see, ping us. Uh, if there is something that you wish we could add or whatever, by all means, let us know. Again, take the quick survey, let us know how we're doing, and if there's anything you feel we can improve, glad to hear it. This too is open source, by the way. <laughs> I like to point that out as well. So uh, let's get started, and we'll just build some projects and go through some various different uh, scenarios here. 
So I'm going to stay down kind of that broad path here today. I'm going to use Maven. I'm going to use Java, but again, works fine with Gradle, uh, Kotlin, Groovy, what have you. I'm going to use the current version of Spring Boot. I'm just going to change this to the hecklers because it doesn't work otherwise. Just kidding. <laughs> oh, boy. Tough crowd. OK. So <laughs> So we're going to start off with, uh, with just form-based authentication. In many cases, this is what you're used to in, in various different uh, applications you use, maybe even your corporate apps. It's just user ID and password, right? And that's sufficient in, in many cases. Uh, so we're just going to start off with form-based authentication. So I'll do sec form. And I'm going to select a few dependencies here. So I'm going to uh, just bring in the web dependency. Um, oh, come on. I'm, I blew this up, and now it's, not, uh, now it's fighting me here. So web dependency. And I'm going to, of course, bring in the dependency for Spring Security. Those of you who are not familiar with the Spring Initializer, it just launches you quickly. It doesn't really generate any code other than the main application class and main method. But what it does is it allows you to choose your dependencies. It zips up the project. You download it. You start developing fast and easy. Now, I will say this. If you're not using Spring Boot, again, why? Uh, <laughs> Uh, Spring Boot has some really cool capabilities, uh, three of which I like to point out. One is your um, simplified dependency management. So I chose two dependencies, but that brings in various different libraries that I need to provide a capability. It really doesn't make sense to have pages and pages of dependencies when 99% of the time you use all the same stuff together. If you want to provide a capability, you have to bring in seven libraries or what have you. So it makes sense to say, if I want to provide a security capability, I need these 15 things. So we have simplified dependency management. We have bills of material that bring these in, starter palms, if you will. Uh, it also has uh, simplified deployment, ease of deployment. So you have your Uber jar. Uh, you don't have to do that. You can create war files. But again, it kind of makes sense to have a deployable that works anywhere. Uh, and then, of course, the big thing is auto configuration. Because with auto configuration, it takes a lot of that heavy lifting off of your back. You can get in and tweak anything you want to, but you often don't need to, which, again, is really nice. So we've got our basic uh, dependencies here. I'm gonna just going to generate the project. And we'll save that to our desktop. And we'll open that. We'll unzip that. And we'll open that in our favorite IDE, NetBeans. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> Any NetBeans fans in here? I like NetBeans, OK? I pick on my friends. Uh, NetBeans is a great IDE. It has great spring support. Uh, if you're using NetBeans, by all means, continue to use NetBeans. It's an awesome, awesome tool. Uh, Any Eclipse users? Eclipse is also a great. <laughs> Eclipse is also an IDE. I'm kidding, OK? A little, a little. Eclipse, <laughs> Eclipse has everything. It's just sometimes hard to find what you need, right? Uh, we, we actually have a Spring Tool Suite build of Eclipse, which is really awesome. It has great cloud deployment capabilities. Every time a, a colleague of mine shows me what's new, I, I, I love it. It's really nice. Uh, but I, IntelliJ fits my workflow better, so, so that's kind of what I use. Um, but, but again, do what makes you happy. So I'm going to uh, go into my project here. And the first thing I'm going to do, well, I don't even need to visit my palm. Um, let's just go straight to the application, or ac actually, just straight to the application. Let's, uh, let's get rolling here. OK, so the first thing I'm going to do is just create a REST controller so we can have something to see, right? So class, and this will be our form controller, controller. And let's just create a get mapping for slash. And let's see. Uh, we'll return a string. We'll say, this is for everyone. So everyone should be able to uh, get at this particular endpoint. So we'll just return, hello, everyone. And that's, uh, that's good. So that's pretty generic, right? I'm going to keep the examples really simple so I can focus on the things that I really want to focus on, the important stuff. Uh, and then let's, let's do a get mapping. And of course, we need an admin page so our administrators can see our, our application and administer that for us, hopefully responsibly, right? And this is be, will be for admin only. And return, uh, let's see, we'll do h1 administrator this page and slash h1 and greetings admin. 
sweet. Okay, so let's go ahead and start that and just see what we have. Because so far all we've done is create the, uh, the application, right? We've specified a couple of dependencies, we've created the application, created an endpoint, and off we go. So let's go here. I use, uh, I use HTTP Pi. HTTP Pi. Uh, any fans? It's like curl for humans. Right? It's actually much prettier in the, <laughs> yeah, they actually say that. That's not my line. Uh, but curl works, right? It's, it's a great tool, but HTTP actually formats things quite nicely, so uh, I like it. It also lets you do shortcuts. So if you're hitting localhost, it assumes localhost. You can eliminate that and just type your port number if you have a port, otherwise it assumes 80. So we're just going to hit the main, uh, the, the root. And, and we see this kind of interesting thing coming back, right? So the first thing we see is that we've got a few things happening here. We've got, uh, well, for one thing I want to point out is no sniff. So our X content type options, this is one of those headers I was talking about before. Uh, if you have content sniffing in your browser, if you allow that, or in your user agent, what that means is that it'll check and say, that smells like a JPEG, or I think that's a PNG file. I can, in, I can do that. I can manage that on my own. So what happens is it tries to interpret it with, based on its understanding of what your content is. The problem is things aren't always what they appear, right? So you don't want your user agent sniffing the content and acting on its own behalf. You want to lock that down. So of course we want to deny that. We want to say no sniff. Don't, don't try to determine what the content is. Just sh show it the way I tell you to show it. So that closes that hole. We also have X frame options to deny. What happens when you allow frames is that you can have what's called click jacking. So if you have an application and you have you know, a few input fields and maybe a, a button down here, and you fill it out and you click the button, if there's a, a, an invisible frame, a transparent frame over that button, you may be clicking on something that you don't realize you're clicking on, right? So you don't want to allow frames. Uh, you just want typically, well, exactly what's shown on the, the page to be all that's on the page. And then cross-site scripting protection. This is a fairly blunt instrument at this point, right? It just denies it. It just closes it out. If you're using a content delivery network, you may need to change that, where you allow for certain other uh, scripts or sites, excuse me, to uh, provide content. But in this case, we're just closing it off because Spring Security is what? Secure by default. We're not Mongo. <laughs> I'm teasing a little bit about that. I mean, we're, as developers, we're largely to blame, not entirely, but we're largely to blame for why Mongo is, is kind of, suffers the, the, um, the reputation of being insecure, because as developers, we want something super simple to get started with, right? Get up and running, fast, no friction. And of course, what that means is if you don't make things secure, then we never go back and fix that. We never close the holes. Uh, and that was a lot of, of course, Mongo's issues. We don't take that approach. With Spring, we go secure it by default, and then you can loosen that where needed. So, OK. Uh, of course, down here, we see that when we made the request, we're unauthorized, because we had no credentials, right? So we just hit the, tried to hit this endpoint and saying, ah, 401, unauthorized. Now, if we go back, uh, because again, we didn't provide a lot of information, but with auto configuration, with Spring Boot and Spring Security's auto configuration, uh, we can see that we've got a generated security password here. So right off the bat, we're using Spring Security. It says, hey, look, I know you're going to want to secure this. Obviously, you have Spring Security in your class path. So let me just lock this down some way. So what I'm going to do now is just copy this. And we're going to do the same thing, only this time I'm going to do a dash dash auth user. That's, again, the default and the password. And there we see. Again, the same headers, of course. But we see, hello, everyone. So we've got to our, our main uh, root, URI. So let's go ahead and see if we can hit the admin page, slash admin. And of course, maybe that's not so good, <laughs> right? We have no permissions in place where we can get to the admin page. It's just open. As long as we can log in, as long as we're auth uh, authenticated, we're in. Uh, and we'll go ahead and hit the browser from here on out, but I kind of like to show the headers as well. So, so right off the bat, we've got some security in place. It's locked down. But of course, that's not the best way, right? We don't want people to share passwords. There's no accountability there. We also don't want to have to, every time we refresh the application, to send out a new password. So let's go back and tighten that up just a little bit. What we need to do is add some authentication and authorization. Now, what's the difference? Authentication is, what's your name, sir? Sure. What is it? Milanju? Close? OK. Are you you? Can you prove that you are you? 
Hopefully so, right? <laughs> so, so that's authentication. I am who I say I am. Authorization is, okay, Milan, should, should you have access to this resource or that resource? Maybe, maybe not that one, but this one, yes, you should. That's authorization. So authentication is, I'm me. Authorization is, I have access to that, right? So you, a lot of times you hear authentication and authorization, complementary uh, concepts, right? So I'm going to just enable web security, and this allows us, we're going to start by, by overriding some, again, some of those assumed uh, auto-configured uh, uh, things that we already had in place just out of the box. So I'm going to create a security config, and we're going to extend our web security configure adapter. And let's see, I'm going to, I guess, start off with overriding our, whoops, our configure method. And this will be our authorization. Authorization. We'll come back to that momentarily. <laughs> so for our authentication, we need to create a bean uh, to create a user detail service, right? And this will be how we authenticate, uh, how we prove we are who we say we are. So we'll just call this authentication. And we need to create some user details. Um, OK. So how do you spell your name? Really loudly. M I L L A C? N C. Oh. Correct? One L. Okay. M I L A N C O. Milan Milancho? Okay. All right. So I'm going to use you as our bad example. Is that okay? <laughs> I normally use me, but I'm really glad that you're helping me out here because. <laughs> okay. So I'm going to create a, a user, Milancho. Uh, so equals. Uh, let's see, so user.builder, and we're going to, uh, let's see, username, uh, milancho, uh, password, uh, password, because that never happens in the real world, right? <laughs> okay, so, uh, so we're going to give you the roles of user, because obviously, I mean, with a password that week, we can't make you an admin. That's just terrible. Uh, and then we're just going to build. OK, so we need uh, user details. We need another uh, victim. I mean, volunteer. Uh, wh what is your name? Maria. Maria? M-A-R-I-A? <laughs> I, I should have started with her. This is awesome. OK, uh, oops, typo. Uh, Maria, OK, yes? Is that right? Yes? OK, it wasn't quite as easy as I thought. But that's, I, my name is just Mark. You know, it's just <laughs> four short letters. I always feel like, I'm, I feel like I'm giving everyone too easy of a time of it. You know, I need to like add letters or something. OK, Maria, pleasure to meet you. OK, so let's see, user.builder and username. Ma, ma, I can't even type now. OK, uh, let's see, why is this? Uh, is that doing that? OK, so dot password. Uh, let's see, we'll make this a strong. This, I'm doing all the, all the right stuff here, right? Word, OK. So that's, no, that's going to be too hard to type in the demo. We'll just say strong password. We'll use our imagination, right? <laughs> OK, so we'll give you roles of user and admin. And then let's just build that. Uh, OK, so then I want to return new. And I'm just going to use an in-memory details manager. Uh, whether you're storing, I mean, likely you're storing uh, behind the scenes, you're using something like Spring Data, J JDBC, or LDAP, or what have you. That's perfectly fine. Uh, they're all branches of the same tree, right? They're all various different kinds of user details managers. Uh, so I'm going to, uh, let's see, I'll add in Milan Milancho and Maria. And that's good. I do want to, though, uh, just show what we have here. So let's see. Um, so Milanjo's password. And oh, it's OK. It, this is just a demo. <laughs> uh, so get password. And we'll go here and Maria and Maria. OK. So let's take a look to see what we have so far.
How are we doing on time? We're good. Okay, this is excellent. All right, so this allows me a little bit more time to show some things that I sometimes have to skip over. Uh, why did that not do that? Oh, there it is. Okay, good. I just skipped right past it. Now, we see that there might be a problem here because this looks like plain text. And that's just because it is plain text, right? <laughs> that's, that's generally kind of frowned upon. Uh, so we don't want to do that. Uh, what we really want to do is use some kind of a password encoder. Now, just I guess just for argument's sake, what I can do is, is show you, uh, let's see, actually I'll just do this, localhost 8080. Because by default, uh, Spring Security says, look, you're going to need to log in, log out, so I'll provide those, a basic log in and log out form for you if you don't provide one yourself. Again, you can provide a really fancy one, but you don't have to. I mean, you can get started this way, it works fine. Uh, so let's see, Mil uh, Milancho, uh, right? And then password. Now see, it didn't work. But if we go back here, we can see why. Uh, because at this point, we see that, uh, yeah, there's, there's no password encoder mapped, which is a, a bit of a problem, right? We need to encode that password somehow. That's the, uh, the whole no plain text screed that I just did. Uh, so what, what I'm going to do is just create a password encoder. Uh, equals password encoder factories. Uh, oops, <laughs> I always want to do that. So password encoder, get too excited. I don't want to charge forward. And I'm going to use the create delegating password encoder method. And if we go in and take a look at that, we can see a couple of other really nice things because we support a lot of different ways of encoding and decoding passwords. We can see here that bcrypt is the default, which is a good default, right? But we also support some things because you know, organizations, public and private, can't always upgrade right away. So sometimes they're using some old hashes. Sad, but true. So we still support things like MD4, MD5, even though, yeah, you know, SHA-1. But, but we also support things like PBKDF2. Um, you know, my personal favorite, no-op. It's just like it sounds, there's no op. It's basically plain text, so don't do that. <laughs> That's just for demos. I just don't even like to use it for demos because I'm afraid somebody will like expediently try to use it and then wind up in trouble. Uh, but, but bcrypt is our default, right? The nice thing about this is we can add them as we go. So when a better encryption algorithm becomes available, we can integrate that, and it's non-disruptive. We can even make it, you can even make it, where when your users log in, it'll automatically upgrade that encryption algorithm which is really, really slick. So I like to show that because I just think that's a really nice, uh, nice feature as well. So let's go back to our application. Uh, so we have our encoder. So what we're going to do now is just do our password encoder.encode. And we'll just encode that password. And the same thing for Maria's password. So password encoder.encode. And let's try that again and see if we have any better results. So now, when we go down here and look at the passwords, we can see that uh, they look significantly more secure, don't they? So we're indicating that we have, oh, it's kind of flickering. Oh, it's not there, good. So we're indicating that we have uh, this password stored using, or encrypted using bcrypt, which is really nice. Uh, it also, in each of the, anytime you encrypt something, it will store that, uh, the type of encryption it's using. Some folks worry about that. They say, well, is it as secure? Well, actually, every algorithm that you use typically has some kind of a header information anyway, so even if you don't specifically put that, uh, it's very easy to see what it is. Uh, it's just that this is a convenience thing. So once again, we've got those encrypted. So now let's go out and we'll see if we've got a little better results here. So let's see, password. And look at that. OK, let's blow that up a little bit. Hello, everyone. OK, so that worked nicely. Now if we go up and just do a log out. Are you sure? Oh, I blew it up. Yeah, it's quite large now. So uh, Maria. Ah. I hit it. I just didn't tap it hard enough. Love the new Mac keyboards, by the way. Uh, <laughs> strong password. Oh. Let me see if I can get you locked out here, Maria. Oh, OK, so it worked. So everything worked. And that's kind of a quick introduction to form-based authentication. And if your needs are fairly straightforward, that may be enough. Again, we all use apps every day that just use uh, form-based authentication, user ID and password. Uh, and if it's done right, it's, you know, that's, that's good and sufficient in many cases. But, oh, sorry. But 
Uh, there are other cases where you might need something a bit more sophisticated. Has anyone heard of OAuth 2? Or just OAuth? Good. Has anyone heard of OpenID? Fewer hands, right? Uh, OAuth, I like, I like to start with this story. Uh, our good friends at Okta, anyone heard of Okta? Okta is a security company as well. Uh, Spring Security, by default, out of the box, out of the box, virtual box, uh, supports things like Google authentication or Google OAuth, uh, Facebook, and uh, GitHub. Personally, I wouldn't recommend using Facebook, but that's just me. Uh, you know, but do what makes you happy. Uh, but Okta also provides an OAuth uh, mechanism, OAuth, open ID and OAuth 2 authentication mechanism. Our friends at Okta like to point out this example, and I've loved it so much, I've kind of taken it for mine as well. Back in the old days, back in the bad old insecure days of the internet, <laughs> when someone would create an application that they wanted to be able to share authorizations, to share permissions, how did they do that? Pre-OAuth. The answer is badly, right? <laughs> uh, does anyone know the, the application Yelp? Yelp is like a restaurant, well, other things too, but I use it mainly for food obviously. Uh, so, so Yelp allows you to go and find restaurants in your general vicinity, or better yet, coffee shops. And they allow you to see the reviews and see what your friends have gone to, where they've gone, and what have you. So in the early days of Yelp, before OAuth, they said, hey, look, this is a social application, right? You want to be able to see where your friends have been. Because when Maria tells me it's a good coffee shop, I, I want to know. I want to go there, right? So, so they said, look, um, how are we going to do this? Well, you've created an account, so what's your email address? Do you want to be able to find your friend's stuff? And of course you say, well, yeah, I want to see where everyone's going. So what's your email address? Okay, mark.heckler gmail.com. Oh, Gmail, that's great. Um, what's your password? <laughs> we'll harvest your contacts, and then we will, you know, we'll, we'll use that to build out your, your network, your friend's network, if you will. Uh, and then we'll get rid of that, you know, login and stuff. We won't use it after that, wink. Uh, but, but we'll do that temporarily. And, and I'm not busting on Yelp, right? This was kind of pretty much how everyone had to do it. They had to do something in order to build that social aspect into their apps if they wanted to be social. Well, of course, this was a bad, bad thing. And we look at it now, and it's terrible. We laugh, but it was the way of the world, right? Uh, so OAuth was created, OAuth 1 was created to kind of solve this problem. OAuth 1 was kind of generally terrible. Uh, so, so OAuth 2 came quickly on its heels. And OAuth 2 provided a good way to, to, to delegate authorizations, to give permissions for certain things but not other things, right? The problem was it really didn't do anything about authentication. So people wound up kind of rolling their own authentication on top of that, which again is a bit of a problem. So OpenID Connect was created as kind of a shim, an, an extra wrapper uh, to provide that authentication. So then OAuth 2 can provide the authorization control. So, uh, so we're going to do that. What I'm going to do is create a, a, an OpenID Connect uh, application, a microservice that allows us to log in and then uh, forwards us to whatever service we want to use to authenticate. Uh, and then I'm going to create a resource server to, again, share resources that we can access that we want to get to our stuff, right? Uh, so I'm going to start off here, and we'll just change this out to OIDC uh, server. And I'm going to also bring in Webflux, uh, Reactive Web, because that gets me access to the Reactive Web client. I'm not going to do anything with Reactive programming really today, but uh, in the, well, actually, up until fairly recently, REST template was the preferred way of accessing and interoperating with other services, right, using Spring. Uh, REST template is blocking, blocking only. Web client gives you access to blocking and non-blocking endpoints, so it's a bit more versatile. has a few more blades in that Swiss Army knife. So I'm going to bring that in, generate uh, our project, and just for expediency, I'm just going to change this to uh, a resource server, and I'll eliminate that, and we'll just generate the same project or another project here as well. <coughs> Excuse me. OK, so let's go open that up. And very quickly, we'll start off with that. Come on. Come on, IntelliJ. There we go. OK. So the first thing I'm going to do is go to my Palm. And this has almost everything that I need, but I do need to add a few libraries that aren't included in, in the um, uh, Spring Initializer at this point. So I'm going to bring in my OpenID Connect dependencies here. 
Uh, and there are just four dependencies here for Spring Security for Config to allow Java Config of your Spring Security uh, configuration. Uh, we're going to create an OAuth2 client, so I want that dependency. I also want the OAuth2 Jose dependency, which is the JavaScript object signing and encryption uh, dependency, which gets us uh, things like uh, Java web keys and things like that, uh, as well as your, obviously, ob object signing and encryption. Uh, and then I'm going to bring in the Okta Spring Boot starter, so that way I can do some stuff with Okta as well. Uh, then I'm going to hit my application properties. And, and actually, I need to rename this. I don't have to do this. Uh, but rather than do key value pairs, I find it useful to change this to a YAML file, because that way I can do uh, nested uh, properties as well. And then I'm just going to uh, bring in my OpenID Connect dependencies. Now, here I've got my client IDs and secrets. It's not really a secret. Everything routes back to localhost 8080, so you know it's not that much of a hole here I'm showing you. <laughs> Uh, and then we have our uh, Java, or excuse me, JSON web token endpoint that we can exchange our credentials for a, a jot. Uh, and then let's uh, let's just get started. Whoops, not that. There we go. Okay. So really quickly, what I want to do is create a REST controller. Uh, this will be our class OIDC controller. Er, whew, typing's going downhill fast. Okay. So get mapping, and we'll just. Uh, do this, string, hello. OK, and we'll just do return, hello, j prime, extra emphasis. There we go. OK, so if we start off with this, and I'll go ahead and quickly run this, and then we'll dive. So we're up and running. Oh, we're not. Oh, because I forgot to uh, shut down the other one. Let's do that. Port conflicts, always a thing. OK, so we're up and running. And I'm just going to localhost 8080. And then we see, because if you, if you remember, when I go back to here and I go to my application properties, I specified a couple of different OAuth2 options, right? I want to be able to log in using Google credentials as well as Okta credentials. So if I go back here, we can see that that's exactly what I'm presented with. So I'm going to start with Google. And sign in. So what's, what's my user ID? And it's then going to prompt me for my password. And then look at this. this I find this really nice, right? Because I have two-factor authentication enabled on my Google account. So guess what? In order to authorize me, it's going to require that here as well. Uh, it's, it's just kind of a nice little extra. No extra charge, right? So I plug in my YubiKey, and then I just Tap that, and there I go. So, so again, you get a little bit more security. Again, no extra charge. It's just kind of fact, factored in uh, <laughs> because I'm using Google uh, for my uh, OAuth and OpenID. So of course, oops, we're up and running there. So now if I go up and just log out here, log out, and then let's try Okta. Well, actually, let, let's skip this because we are short on time. We'll do Okta the next time around. OK. so. That's all I wanted to do here until I go and create my resource server. So let's do that. And oh, actually, you know what? Go here and unzip that. Oops. There we go. OK, so the first thing I want to do is go to my POM once again, add in the few dependencies that aren't already there for my resource server. Again, very similar to the other one. The big difference is instead of an OAuth2 client, what I have is an OAuth2 resource server. Kind of makes sense, because that's what we're building. And then I'll go to my application properties. We will rename those, uh, again, that file to YAML so I can structure this a bit better. And then I'm going to um, just paste those in. So these are the things that I need. I need JOT support so we can pass a bearer token and use that for our resource server versus having to reauthorize and pass credentials. Uh, so let's go ahead and write that really quickly. <coughs> Excuse me. So I'm going to create here a REST controller, and we're just going to establish a base mapping here of resources. Resources. And this will be our class uh, resource controller. Rest controller. OK, so we need a get mapping, or should have a get mapping, let's say, of something. This is just our basic uh, run of the mill. Get something. 
and return. This is really something. <laughs> All right. Okay. So examples aren't my strong suit. Okay. Uh, and we'll do a get mapping here. And let's just check out our claims, right? Our OAuth2 claims. So I'm going to, uh, let's see, string. I'll return these as string, get claims. And we will inject our authentication principle. We're using, again, JOTS, JSON web tokens, to provide our authentication for our resource server, uh, provide our, our um, uh, means of authorizing uh, access to resources. So we'll just do a return jot dot get claims. Nope, get claims. Um, and why is that barking at me? Jot dot get claims. Oh, <laughs> we'll convert it to a string. That's always nice. Okay, so then we'll go and just uh, because I think it's kind of nice to see, we'll check out our email. Our subject uh, in, in OAuth2 parlance, what is our subject? What is our email that we're logged in with? So get uh, email. Um, once again, we'll, we'll use our authentication principle, our jot to do that, and return jot.get. And we actually have a convenience method here for subject, so that's good. Uh, let's see. So in order to establish the authorization or clear out what we need to do. So let's do our enable web security once again. Class security config extends web security configure adapter. Again, I'm just going to override our configure methods, and that way we can determine our authorizations. And we're going to set that HTTP dot authorize requests. And we're going to use an MVC matcher here. I kind of skipped over this part just due to time and our user, uh, user authentication, user and password. Uh, but you can lock down different things like the admin page separately. Same thing here. We're going to match on, uh, let's see, we'll match on claims and, of course, any sub pages. Uh, we want to see if they have the authority or the claim in OAuth parlance, uh, the scope. So um, scope, open ID. And let's see, MVC matchers will do for email slash star has authority, scope, email, uh, and, and we want to uh, enable the OAuth to a resource server and JOT support. OK, so that should be sufficient for that. I'm going to go ahead and restart that. Meanwhile, we're going to go back to our Well, fine, be that way. So let's see. Go back to our open ID connect. And we need to do some things in order to allow the connection from that, right, to pass the bearer token to our resource server. So I'm just going to, oh, actually, that's not what I need. Um, there we go. OK, so I'm going to create first a web client. So we'll create a web client bean. And I'll just call this client. And so let's see. The first thing we need to do is do a little bit of uh, work here to create our exchange filter function. So we have OAuth2 support. So I'm just going to call this function uh, equals uh, new. And of course, this expects two parameters, right? A client registration repository for our, uh, for our clients that we have access to and want to use, and then an authorized client repository as an OAuth2 authorized client. Uh, the good thing is that, that Spring Security creates these for us automatically uh, if we, uh, again, unless we override them, they're created and provided for us. So this will be our reg repo. And then our OAuth2 authorized client repository, which keeps track of our uh, authorized clients. Uh, and let's see, so we'll call this client repo. And we'll just use those here, reg repo, client repo. And I'm really close on time, so I'm going to have to speed this along. Uh, so we'll take our function. We'll set the default OAuth2 authorized client, which just means that whoever's logged in, we're using their credentials. In most cases, you'll, this is fine, but that's why it's not a default, because in some places, you don't want that. And then we'll return a uh, web client dot builder uh, base URL, and we're pointing to our resource server, localhost 8081 slash resources. And we'll apply our function here and build. Ooh, we're getting close. OK, so 
I'm just going to inject our web client. There we go. And we'll keep this pretty simple. I'll just go straight to the claims. String get claims and return client.get.uri and we'll add on claims.retrieve. Uh, we're converting this body that we're getting back, the response body, to a mono, which is a publisher, a reactive publisher. Very easy to go from reactive to non-reactive, though. You just block. So we'll stop there. We'll just go and we'll show and make sure it works, and then we'll close it up. OK, so go back here, refresh. Log in. We'll log in with Okta. Boom. Waiting, waiting. There we go. So now if we just want to go check out our claims, which is the only, oops, resources claims, the only thing I wired up due to time. Oh, you're killing me, Smalls. OK, so web security configure adapter. Claims, resources, claims. Hmm. 881 resources. OK, does anyone see what I'm doing wrong? Otherwise, I'm just going to have to call it. What, what's that? Oh, the port. Uh, yeah, let's see. So application YAML. Uh, that's 8081, so we're good there. The, oh, uh, no, no, actually, I'm hitting the, the OIDC server, which is 8080. So that should be right. Well, as much as I hate to do this, all the working code is out on GitHub. <laughs> Man, I hate leaving on a bad note here, but, uh, but this should, uh, that's interesting. OK. All right, if anyone's curious what I missed, uh, come see me after, I'll happily provide it. But let me just go in here so, you can, uh, so we can wrap up and you can see where to get that code. So here's actually all the code that you saw that works, uh, plus some, uh, out on my GitHub repo, Spring Security for Noobs, uh, and the Spring Security main project page, which is an awesome reference point as well. Uh, great jumping off point, good documentation, just solid. So thanks for coming. Please stay in touch and enjoy J Prime.